Last night I sat upon Nyali Beach, sipping strong black Kenya coffee and listening to the wind and the waves. From down the beach came the sound of music and the clink and tinkle of happy diners enjoying a meal, making the most of their East Africa holiday. High above, the silver crescent of the waning moon smiled down upon the peaceful waters like the gleaming grin of the Cheshire cat from that classic children's tale. When I was young, I dreamed of visiting the Horn of Africa and seeing firsthand the cities with the mystical sounding names, Mombasa, Mogadishu, Djibouti, and Dar es Salaam. More incantation than simply words, they are a joy to speak out loud. I've now realized my childhood dream, but the Horn of Africa no longer seems to be such an enchanted place. The serenity of last evening is now giving way to the scream of turbine engines and the pop of occasional gunfire. Babies cry for want of food, and skinny kids rush to the barbed wire, hoping to be noticed as the crew and I give away our box lunch crew meals. A weak, emaciated girl sits by the wire fence separating the refugees from the airplane. She is too frail to ask for food. My co-pilot, himself the father of eight, tries to comfort her with the offer of something to eat, but she is too far gone. We later learned that she did not survive. The 40,000 pounds of rice, beans, and oil we carry each trip in our aircraft's cargo bay may not seem like much when measured against the size of the crisis, but it keeps these people alive and helps build back their strength. More important, however, the Lockheed Hercules is quickly seen as a symbol of hope. The mere appearance of the plane in the sky overhead tells them they haven't been forgotten, that someone remembers them and cares about what happens to them. But there is no denying the great irony in all of this, that while thousands of lives can be saved by flying food and medicine where they are needed, it is almost impossible to help any particular individual. Wherever we land, Bellet Wayne, Mogadishu North, Mog West or Baidoa, we do so at the sufferance of the local warlord and his so-called security forces. The troopers in these private armies are kids who belong to the local gangs. They move in and out of the airplane like ants at a picnic, slipping into the cargo bay to pillage the igloo cooler of its cold soft drinks, then strutting back to their technical vehicles, pickup trucks stolen either from local owners or foreign aid agencies, and mounted with heavy weapons plundered from the abandoned armories of the fallen central government. These wannabe warriors adopt an insouciant air that is only possible when you are young, have a machine gun, and believe yourself master of all you survey. We normally return from Somalia empty, but today we had a special cargo. Ayub Abdi, a Somali child, is how the manifest read. Ayub is a tyke of three to five years old, who was left behind when his mother was evacuated from that piece of desert we call Moog West. He is a clean, quiet, attractive child. His initial reluctance to fly has given way to a smile as we ply him with Coca-Cola, peanut butter, and fresh fruit on the journey back to Mombasa to be reunited with his mother. As we fly back to Mombasa in our hotel on Nyali Beach, I cannot but be struck by the beauty of the Indian Ocean coastline between Somalia and Kenya. Lush green vegetation, white sandy beaches, with the ocean shading from turquoise to deep sapphire. When viewed from a point five miles above the turquoise sea, the Horn of Africa is still an enchanting and enchanted land. But on the ground, the magic, at least for me, has died away.
My time here is growing short. Soon I will be returning home, and I'm not sure that I will ever come back. My crew is not scheduled to fly today, so my co-pilot and I have hitched a ride on the early morning flight to Baidoa. We plan to spend the morning visiting with the Red Cross workers and meeting the people who have come to this city seeking refuge from the fighting in the countryside. It is important to me that we meet the Somali refugees face to face before I go. I would like them to see there is another human being in that airplane that passes low over the city three times each day. I would also like them to know that I am an American and should it be that I am the only American they ever meet, I would like them to remember that when they were in trouble, it was an American who came to their aid. Baidoa was once the premier city of the province. Our driver tells me there used to be a music festival here. It is a town of stone and stucco buildings, many damaged or destroyed by gunfire. The streets are paved and in reasonably good shape. The roadways are lined with utility poles strung with electric and telephone wires, once functional, but now useless. The quotes, governor of the area, has provided a security detail to guard the Red Cross warehouse. They are stationed in an open field in front of the warehouse compound, armed with six Jeep-mounted recoilless rifles and a twin 23mm aircraft cannon. It's an impressive collection of large bore weaponry and is certainly capable of making a lot of gun smoke and noise. But they are out in the open, without cover, and could easily be defeated by a handful of trained infantry. A little further along, we come to the one operating water well in town. It is housed in a large, crumbling stone building. Outside, a line of donkey carts stretches around the square like taxi cabs at an airport. The donkey drivers relax in the dust, awaiting their turn to fill the water barrels mounted on their carts. Women and children trudge along the street, each lugging a wooden crate slash pack frame contraption on their back. Inside the wooden box is an amphora-like water jar. I ask Paul, the Red Cross delegate, if there are any other sources of water in the town. He tells me there are many wells, but they have either been sabotaged by dropping stones down the pipe or the pumps have been stolen. A jeep with half a dozen armed young men zooms up and down the road, its horn blowing constantly to clear the way. One guy is hanging onto the handles of a big Russian-made machine gun, struggling to keep his balance as the jeep swerves between the donkeys and the pedestrians walking in the road. I notice there are only about half a dozen cartridges left in the belt feeding the gun. At last, we reach the Red Cross compound. We pass through a steel gate and into the courtyard. Inside we find more Toyotas marked with red crosses paired with unmarked technical vehicles sporting heavy weapons. At the compound, Paul, the Red Cross delegate, gives us a briefing on the Red Cross strategy for dealing with this famine. Their idea is to set up feeding kitchens outside the city so as to intercept the refugees before they reach Baidoa. The purpose is twofold. First, it is hoped that by doing it this way, they can keep the number of people serviced by each feeding center manageable. Second, by keeping people out of the city, they hope to keep the population of Baidoa down and thus avoid the risk of epidemics brought on by large numbers of people without adequate sanitary facilities. Because of the numbers of people involved, the kitchens are only able to provide two meals a day, one of rice and a second of beans and oil. The ICRC also provides each family with a dry ration of rice and beans that they can cook for themselves. All of the people in Somalia are not destitute. They have money. Many can and do buy their food at the market. It is hoped that the provision of a basic reserve of food to each family will keep downward pressure on the price of food in the marketplace. This large supply of free grain provided by the United States and the European community is intended to serve as a counterbalance to local merchants' desire to profiteer during the crisis and is not a replacement for a functioning marketplace. Since you will be acting as our guide this morning, Paul asks where we'd like to go first. We tell him we'd like to meet some of the people who have sought refuge in the city. Paul talks to our driver, who passes the information along to the security guards who will tail us on the journey, and we mount up. As we prepare to leave the compound, however, an incident happens which nearly brings our trip to a premature end. One of the security guards jumps up on the side of the truck sporting what looks like a 30 caliber machine gun. 
He totters for a moment, then falls backwards. In a panic, he reaches out for support and grabs onto the handle of the gun. The gun breaks loose from its improvised mount, and trooper and machine gun topple from the truck, making a noise like a stick being dragged along a picket fence as the ammunition belt rattles over the side of the pickup. Trooper and gun hit the ground hard, and I fully expect the gun, which is pointing straight at me, to fire. Luckily, it does not. Except for his pride, the young man is unhurt. He climbs back onto the truck, refits the gun, and we drive off. We drive for a couple of miles and then stop by a field full of people. In the middle of the road is a pile of sacks labeled Gift of the People of the United States of America. Two hands, one black and one white, clasped in a gesture of friendship, appear above the red, white, and blue logo of USAID. This is the latest field kitchen established in Baidoa. After the refugee center, we move on to the hospital, a long, one-story structure with a central entrance and two wings. A donkey is tied to the broken stump of a tree just outside the gate. Passing through the gate, I encounter my first dead body, a child, covered with a rough gray blanket. We walk through the entrance and into one of the operating rooms. It's clean, but the furnishings are ancient and look very much like movie props from the laboratory of Dr. Frankenstein. On the floor beneath the operating table is a large plastic container full of bloody bandages. There is a noise in the hall. Four bearers bring in a litter with a semi-conscious man on it. His leg is wrapped in a bloody bandage. I leave through a side door so as not to intrude on this man's suffering. On my way out, I encounter a bearded man in surgeon's attire. I say hello, so does he. We are each surprised to find the other is an American. The surgeon is from Iowa. Back home, he is a general surgeon and has taken leave from his practice to volunteer in Somalia. He will be in Baidoa for the next 30 days. I ask him what it is like, and he tells me it's pretty desperate. He has only a two-day supply of gauze and tape remaining. He has to ration his supplies, or he would run out in just a few hours. We leave the hospital and return to the airport to catch our flight back to Mombasa. That evening, while sitting at the tiki bar at the Nyali Beach Hotel, having a beer and thinking about what I had seen that day, Jeff Wilcox, the co-pilot on that day's flight, and a fellow South Floridian, arrives. He comes over and asks me, have you heard anything about a hurricane hitting Miami? As we don't have television in our rooms, I say that I hadn't. Flying back here, he goes on, we were listening to the BBC on the HF radio, and they said something about a hurricane hitting Miami. I guess it's pretty bad. He walks over to the bar to get a beer, leaving me to wonder if I, too, am now a refugee. On August 23, 1992, a Force 5 hurricane struck the southern tip of Florida. The only other like it to hit the United States in the 20th century was Hurricane Camille in 1969. Hurricane Andrew's wind gusts reached 170 miles per hour, and the devastation was enormous, especially in Dade County, Florida. 90,000 homes were destroyed or damaged, and a quarter of a million were left homeless. It was the most costly storm in U.S. history.